everybody. Uh, my name is Trey. So thanks, SBF, for the really, really enriching talk right there. Uh, next up, we have David from Skynet. He's a longtime friend of the club and the expo. Um, he helped uh, co-found the Sci Network and uh, now works at Skynet on, which is a layer on two for data sharing and distribution on top of Saya. So he's here to talk about uh, censorship on the internet. Um, so with that, I'll uh, hand it off. Uh, thank you everyone for coming here today. Uh, and I'm excited to be talking on internet censorship in 2022. So some quick background about me. Uh, I've been studying blockchains and working with blockchain technology since 2011. Uh, I founded the SIA protocol in 2014 with Luke Champagne, who's over in the corner. Uh, and then in 2020, we launched a decentralized data sharing protocol called Skynet, uh, where you can share files, uh, Linux ISOs, or big tech data, things like uh, your user's social graph, or you know, comments on a video, or even like pieces of a content feed algorithm. Um, and so to help out Skynet and to give a more friendly like front end or user interface to it, we created a website called SciaSky. Um, and the purpose of SciaSky is just to let users play around with Skynet without having to be a developer. Um, and so this is the URL, it looks like. And this is what the page looks like. Uh, you can just drag and drop files. If you look at the, I uh, don't know how the laser pointer works, but you have the gray bar. It says, do you want to upload a web app or directory? So more than just uploading like pictures that you can send to someone, you can also upload an entire like JavaScript folder or like a whole front end. And you can run a website off of SciaSky.net. And so there's no KYC, there's no sign up. Uh, it's like an easier GitHub pages. So you just you just drag and drop, and then you're off, and you have a website. So uh, at one point, we and this was maybe I think three months after launch. So we launched in February of 2020, and then in May. Uh, we go to our website and we're greeted with this, which is not a typical error page. Uh, this is actually what you get if the domain does not exist at all. Um, and so as far as we could tell, our website was just gone. Uh, and when we dug into it, our servers were running, like Cloudflare was set up correctly, uh, you know, all the, all the routing seemed appropriate. Um, and what had happened was we had actually been pulled entirely from DNS. Uh, so our website was essentially revoked from us, um, and the URL was no longer valid. And this was the result of an exchange with Uniswap, where uh, we had hosted the Uniswap front end. We wanted to help people decentralize their front ends and give them a way to access the decentralized exchange without having to go to app.uniswap.org. If, if you don't know, when you go to something like app.uniswap.org, the front end is entirely controlled by the Uniswap developers. And so we thought by putting it on Skynet, we could give users more control over the code that they're running. Um, the Uniswap had an anti-phishing team. Um, so they had been dealing with phishing issues where people would upload fake Uniswap front ends to the internet and then grab people's seeds and then rob people. Um, and so the anti-phishing team saw our front end, thought that it was a phishing front end as opposed to a legitimate front end, contacted Namecheap, had us pulled off the internet, um, and then for all intents and purposes, uh, we just stopped existing. It was an honest mistake. Uh, Uniswap was not trying to you know, demolish decentralized front ends, uh, but they nonetheless killed us. Um, and then simultaneously, we had set up the wrong email address for receiving reports from Namecheap. Uh, so the abuse reports were actually going to Google. We didn't realize that there are exceptions at the email layer. Um, but we got everything sorted. Uh, we were back on the web in under a day. And the abuse that we had dealt with wasn't real. Um, it, was, it was just an honest mistake. So uh, we, we kept going on. And so we're going to go ahead and just add a censorship tally here. We did, we did get pulled from the DNS layer. 
Um, and the first time it happened, it was just an honest mistake. Uh, less than a month later, I think this was uh, June 2020, we found that the entire US uh, East cluster was just gone. Um, and so we, like users were reporting that they couldn't get in. Europeans were like, oh yeah, it's still there. People in California were like, yeah, it's still there. And then I'm in Boston, I'm like, it's not there, what's going on? We SSH into our servers, it didn't work. Um, our servers had been unplugged, and it turns out our US East provider, Ionos, had pulled the plug on us for phishing. And as we investigated the report, it actually ended up that the phishing website that had been deployed was a genuine phishing website, and they were trying to phish Ionos credentials, and they were targeting Ionos uh, admins. And so, understandably, Ionos was like not very amused with this. Um, and so we'd been greeted by a new problem, which was genuine abuse. Um, and we handled it by, so, so Ionos, despite, you know, we went back and forth with them a bunch. Obviously, we banned the phishing website. Uh, we did, you know, we did what we could to please them. Uh, we couldn't restore relationships. Um, so they, they basically just pulled the plug, wouldn't, wouldn't let us uh, get new servers, wouldn't, wouldn't reconnect them, and we had to switch. Um, but a takeaway from this was that we began building formal processes to handle abuse. So we, we realized that while the Uniswap and Namecheap thing had been like a one-off and an honest mistake, uh, this Ionos thing was probably not a one-off. And if, if people were using SciSky to do phishing attacks once, they'd probably continue doing it in the future. So we, we started the process of building more genuine abuse uh, handling. Um, and then on our censorship record, we can go ahead and add the hosting provider layer. Um, and I want to take, whoops, I want to take a minute to talk about why we want to be able to put websites on the internet without having any barriers to entry. If you're like a college student, or even a high school student, or even a middle school student, and you're messing around with the web, like we, we don't think that you have to be should have to be a legitimate person or like a, a recognized entity to be able to express yourself on the internet. And I think that posting websites is a form of freedom of speech. Um, and so it, this is something that we really want to protect. It's, it's something that we see as valuable. And even though it's being abused for phishing, uh, I think that that's more of a mistake with the way the web is architected such that someone, someone can end up at the wrong website to log into their bank. I think, I think that's more of a problem with how banking is set up. But because we didn't anticipate phishing when we like, established the internet in the first place, we've kind of responded to it by attacking freedom of speech and trying to manipulate the web so that people can only host websites if it's really well established like who they are. Um, and so when it comes to handling abuse on Skynet, we are just infrastructure. We are just like a portal that you drop files on or websites on. And when users are using our website, we don't control the UI the users see. So we can't do the standard stuff like add a report abuse button. Um, like if, if a link exists, it's going to paint a page for the user that is completely under the control of whoever developed that page. Um, and so it, it's kind of a, a tough spot for us, especially with phishing, because I don't think there's a good solution that allows us to definitely stop all phishing attacks while also ensuring that anybody in the world can publish a website and say what's on their mind or present what's on their mind. Um, and so that's kind of a line that we have to continue uh, battling as we try and keep our, our website online, or SciSca online. So uh, at least for now, uh, we, you know, as of, uh, again, this was June, we chose to avoid doing KYC or any sort of like proactive handling, and we decided that we will take websites down when people report to us, we'll add as many lanes as we can to make it easy to report things to us. Again, we, we don't have that much control, um, but we wanted to permit first and then take action later. And uh, that strategy lasted for all of one month, uh, and then we, got in trouble with Google Chrome. So uh, 
I think this was in July. So we're now in July 2020. We've been website operators for all of four months. Uh, and one day, our users report to us that if you visit our site using Chrome, uh, and I believe Brave was included in this, you got this nice big red warning that said, this site ahead contains malware. Uh, and then if you, you look closely, there's no way to like, continue to the website. It, it only says back to safety. Um, and so basically, in, in one instance, we lost access to 2 billion users, 70% uh, of the internet could no longer view our website. And unlike with Namecheap and with Ionos, uh, you know, Namecheap and Ionos are both kind of commodity services that we had chosen, we had signed up for, and like if they have an issue with us, it, we, we made a decision to be in a relationship with Namecheap and Ionos. We had signed a term, terms of service. With Chrome, we had never agreed to be in a relationship with Chrome. We had never signed a terms of service. Um, and Chrome has the, like such a position of power over the web that they can just decide your website's not supposed to exist anymore. Um, and so we we tried to appeal to them. We're like, you know, this is a general purpose website. This is infrastructure. Why are you taking us offline? And Chrome basically presented a bunch of links to us that said these are malware links. This is just some of the malware. It's not all of the malware. And we're not going to remove this warning for your users until all of the malware is gone. And so Chrome basically said, the onus is on you to put in malware detection and figure out, figure out how to handle uh, you know, bad files on your service, which, again, Google is a $1.5 trillion company with 100,000 employees. Uh, at this time, we had like $2 million and I think like 14 employees. Uh, and Google had taken their unelected position, right? No, nobody, there's, there's no democracy around Google Chrome. It's, it's a large corporation that's beholden only to the share price. Um, and they had established themselves as regulators of the internet. And they, you know, they said, you have to do X, Y, Z to be a visitable website on the internet, which uh, to me feels like a gross overstep. Um, and so this, was a much more serious violation, I think, of just how, how net neutrality in the internet should work, because instead of it being a provider that we had signed up for, it was, it was some, something completely out of our control and completely out of control of the population. Um, Google had independently decided that websites must, must do X if they want 2 billion users to be able to access them. Um, so. That actually took us over a year to clean up. Uh, we ended up installing an open source malware scanner, and then we came up with a strategy. We didn't, so it's like, Skynet is decentralized. You can upload files to Skynet from any portal, and you can upload files to Skynet from the command line. You can share links. If someone comes to our website and downloads a file, there's a decent chance that we've never seen the file before. Um, and so if we want to not serve malware, we either have to like scan the file in real time, which dramatically impacts latencies, or what we ended up doing was the first time that we see a file, we'll add it to a queue, we'll serve it to the user anyway, and then we'll scan it for malware later. And so this isn't perfect. It does mean that sometimes malware gets through, but it was enough eventually to appease Google Chrome. Um, and so if you visit our website today, uh, Chrome, Chrome is happy now. Um, and again, that took us something like a year to pull together, uh, which I think it's just, it was frustrating. Uh, then one day, uh, and I think this was probably in, in 2021, closer to 2021, uh, a ton of our infrastructure providers just started revoking access to us. And I, I think what actually clued us in that there was an issue was Namecheap pulled us off the internet again. Um, and so our website disappeared. A, a ton of our servers were offline. It looked like just everyone was mad at us all at once for some reason. And so we're like, what's going on? We're checking in. Things seem OK. Like the abuse handling is up. We're blocking links quickly. And it turns out uh, the number of abuse reports was down, which 
seemed odd because the number of users had increased. And we realized that most of our abuse reports come through email. Any email containing a link to our website was being silently dropped from the system. Um, and so it's, it's not like bounced, and it's not going to spam. To the sender, all indicators made it look like the email had been successfully sent. And then to the receiver, all indicators made it look like uh, the, the email had never existed in the first place. Um, and so this caused a lot of problems, right? Obviously, it got in the way of like, users using the platform and, and sharing links with each other. It also got in the way of us handling abuse. And so we had a period of, of short turmoil where we had to get in touch with all of our infrastructure providers and basically everyone who was sending abuse reports to us over emails and get them to censor the links so that the domain name was not in there. That way, the emails would actually get through. And then our domain as a whole just got like perma spammed. Um, so we were also like emailing investors and like trying to do fundraising. And all of those emails were going to spam. Uh, so we had to switch domain names. And that's why my email is david at skynetlabs.com. It's not david at sciascot.net anymore. This is an artifact of the problems we were having with email. So this was also frustrating because email is not even part of the stack. When you think about a user going to our website, you have like the ISP, the web browser, the hosting provider, the domain registrar. Email's not in the middle of that path. And yet, somewhere along the line, the email entity or the email system of the internet had decided that it didn't want our links to exist. And it interfered with our like daily business practices. And so again, we were basically in a position where we had to take a bunch of proactive measures to deal with infrastructure that's supposed to be reliable and is usually used as an example of decentralized infrastructure. Um, and it had, it had deplatformed us. Um, so we had been deplatformed from email, and we can add that to the censorship record. Um, and so I think that that resolved when the malware situation resolved, but I'm actually not 100% sure because we don't use SciSky email addresses anymore, um, and all of our hosting providers censor, censor the domain uh, just so we can avoid that problem. Um, and then I wanted to leave time for questions and Q&A, but throughout the rest of the year, uh, we had problems with We've, we've had problems with banks that's mostly related to crypto, with payment providers like Stripe and Square, also mostly related to crypto. Uh, we've had problems with ISPs doing DNS hijacking and presenting users, uh, so kind of like the Chrome thing, but instead of Chrome doing it, it's like European ISPs uh, telling their users that they can't visit the website. Uh, our links are blocked on Twitter, so if you send, uh, if you send a, someone a Skylink on Twitter, or like you link them to the Uniswap front end on Skynet, uh, Twitter will not let you click on that link. It'll pop up a warning and tell you not to do it. Uh, so <laughs> there's, there's been a lot. Um, and it's been frustrating because it exposes to us that the internet is composed of a bunch of pieces that all have to work together. If any of them break, your, your, either your website won't work or your business as a whole won't work, and all of them are sufficiently centralized that a single actor in the middle of any of those stacks, and oftentimes that actor is just plain Google, um, can decide for an arbitrary reason that your website's not supposed to exist. And so uh, when we think about things like net neutrality and talk about why infrastructure should be neutral, it's because as the web gets more complicated, as the economy gets more complicated, as we continue building, we have, you know, we, we're pinning more and more moving pieces together and getting them working successfully together. We're, we're gaining power, but we are also increasing the number of points of failure. Um, and so I think my biggest takeaway from like a, you know, how, how should infrastructure be built you need infrastructure to be neutral because the more things that infrastructure plugs into, if it's not neutral, the more ways that you have arbitrary actors who are not elected, answer only to share price, ungoverned, uh, you know, protected by private business law, 
can interfere with other genuine businesses that are not doing anything illegal. Um, and so I, I think this is a big problem moving forward. I also think that uh, politically, the way with, especially with all the like disinformation campaigns, uh, it, it looks like we're going the wrong direction. It looks like we're going in the direction of making infrastructure more opinionated and more centralized and more, we're, we're encouraging providers at more and more layers to be involved in making moral statements. Um, and as we do that, what's effectively going to happen is innovation is going to grind to a halt. Our culture is going to be frozen because anything that's culturally unusual or, or just unexpected is going to be, you know, somewhere in your 400 infrastructure providers that all have to work together, it's, it's gonna upset one of them. And so if, if something has not been done before, as we get infrastructure, as our infrastructure gets more and more complicated, you're not going to be able to do things that have never been done before. You're going to upset somebody, and then they're going to be able to single-handedly shut down your business. Um, and so, yeah, I would say we need, we need to fight for completely neutral infrastructure. And I kind of left this out of the slides, but that's personally why I'm super interested in blockchains and Bitcoin in the first place. Um, because blockchains are perfectly neutral infrastructure, at least as long as you don't have like governance. Um, but I think that we should look at rebuilding the internet, and that's, that's what Skynet's trying to do. We're trying to rebuild the internet so that all of these layers of the stack, rather than being controlled by a party that can insert an arbitrary opinion. And I didn't even mention, when we're running into these censorship issues, these opinions are not from American companies. Like, we've, we've had problems with American companies, we've had problems with European companies, we've had problems with Asian co uh, companies, and our infrastructure providers span dozens of legal jurisdictions and hundreds of conflicting moral opinions. And so, again, it, it's, just, it's just a big, like, diverse mess where it becomes impossible to placate everyone unless you're doing things that you already know are safe. Um, but, so, back to the slides. Uh, we've been able to survive. We've had, especially November through maybe February, uh, like this past November through, through February today, uh, this year, were really rough and our website was mostly offline all the time. But we've, we've been able to build back by adding user signups, by adding automated abuse processing, by doing things like blocking Tor, which again, blocking Tor is very practical in the sense that if you block Tor, uh, the amount of malware, the amount of phishing, and other abuse material that ends up on your website goes down substantially. But it's also a freedom issue. If someone can't get on the internet except through Tor, they can't use Skynet, uh, or at least they can't use Skynet through SciSky.net. And so blocking Tor is something that makes me like uh, deeply unhappy on a personal level. I, I don't want to block Tor. I think Tor is a super important resource, and, and the people who need it the most, I want to make sure that we can extend our service to them. Uh, but at the moment, that contains an enormous amount of liability. Um, and so, and we've literally had uh, police organizations, uh, namely from Australia, explicitly tell us that we need to be blocking Tor or we're going to get in trouble with the police. Um, and so, what, what do you do? Um, we've added tools for mass banning links. That's another thing that deeply unsettles me uh, because as we've seen with like YouTube, when you have mass banning procedures, especially if it's automated in any way, the way we do automatic malware scanning, uh, there are going to be mistakes and it's going to tend to be broad. The incentives on our side are always to be much more heavy handed because the chance that we let something through imposes so much more liability to us than the chance that we destroy something that, that we shouldn't have. That, and, and you see this with copyright infringement on YouTube. Every, everything's getting taken offline. Uh, bands, bands are, it's super easy to hit someone genuine who's not breaking any laws or violating any, any copyright laws. It's, it's easy to hit them with takedowns and give them trouble because these tools are just too, too easy to abuse. And we're, we're in the same spot. Our own tooling is too easy to abuse, but again, the liability of missing something is, is super high, and so at least for now, our hand is kind of forced. Um, what's, what's the side? Okay, so it's kind of out of scope for the talk today. Um, actually, I'm almost out of time. 
there are a bunch of ideas that I have for like, how can we build decentralized content mon uh, moderation? How can we, you know, build KYC that can make sure you're a good person without, you know, sending you through like a government entity? How can how can we make it so that we can k KYC you even if you're like say a middle schooler who's trying to deploy a website? Um, and I I have some ideas. I think. It's an open problem, it's a very difficult problem. I think it is solvable. Uh, I don't think we have the tools to do it today. And if, if I were to say anything, it, was, it would just be that our world is moving in like a super centralized direction. One of the, one of the biggest, uh, not biggest, most common suggestions we get for handling abuse is send every single file to Facebook. Facebook has this like nice API, you send them a file and they'll tell you like thumbs up, thumbs down, uh, should you ban this file. And that just <laughs> seems so revolting to me uh, to, one, send literally all of our customer data over to Facebook, and then two, we, we, don't, we don't know what, that's a black box. Like, we don't know why they gave us a thumbs down, um, and we don't know if they're going to be a good actor in the future. What if, what if, you know, if China, like, say, pays Facebook a huge payoff to start doing thumbs down on, uh, anti-party line content, we don't know. We, we may never know that, that that deal happened. We may never know that, that content is being censored. So uh, yeah, I, th I think there's an enormous amount of pressure right now in the world to be very censorship heavy, to be very liability reducing, I think is a big problem, and that we need to push for neutral infrastructure, uh, both like as we build blockchains, but also in the legislature. I think it's it's important to Enforce that infrastructure can be neutral. And uh, that's all I have to say. Uh, if you want to learn more about Skynet, you can check us out at skynetlabs.com, or you can just go to sciasky.net. And uh, yeah, I'm happy to take one or two questions. In the back. Thanks for your talk, really appreciate it, and have followed you for a few years on Twitter. Um, so you mentioned interfacing with investors uh, while persisting through a lot of these censorship problems. What are you hearing from them along the lines of willingness to bet on neutral, unopinionated infrastructure in a future internet world, and why they won't back that if you keep seeing that massive difference there? Yeah, yeah. So, so the investor problems weren't that they didn't want to back us. It was that they like we couldn't email them because our emails were going to spam. Um, so it was more of a like mechanical issue that we were having. Uh, in general, I think investors have uh, been pro neutral infrastructure. I also think that they're just if if you're neutral, your opportunity for customers is a lot higher. If you can pull off neutrality, your costs are theoretically lower. Um, and so I think, I think there are lots of reasons for investors to prefer that. But so our, our issues were not that investors were unhappy with us for being censored. It was just like mechanically it was tough to reach them because we kept going to spam. Uh, great talk. I, I uh, agree with many of the sentiments here. One question is how do you solve this? Because at the end of the day, <laughs> the hardware vendor can always impose some type of censorship. For example, Apple, right? And the analogy with Chrome, even in the blockchain space, all it takes is MetaMask to ban certain RPC endpoints, and you have the same issue. So what do you think the solution is? Yeah, um, I don't think there's an easy solution. Uh, and actually, there's, there's a line of hardware that I think is generally classified as trusted hardware, although the open source community usually calls it treacherous hardware, uh, where it will basically verify everything that it's serving to the user. And so if, if you like try and play a movie, it'll check and make sure that all the DRM checks out and that you actually own the movie. Um, and then Apple, Apple also did this, tried to do this. They didn't end up rolling it out. But Apple tried to roll out an update where they would scan your phone for uh, child abuse imagery. And then if they found it, they would report you to the police, which again, uh, it sounds super, super dystopian that you would have a device in your home 24-7 that is literally watching everything you do 
and is prepared to report you to the police. Um, it, it just, like, I understand the sentiment of, like, let's catch all the pedophiles, but I don't think that putting Big Brother in your bedroom 24-7 is the right way for society to approach child pornography. I, I think that that trade-off is extremely dangerous and, and it leads to much worse places, especially if the moment that expands from just child pornography to all copyright content, we have a, a big issue and we, we don't know that it won't expand. Like the, the direction has not been the right direction to suggest that it wouldn't expand like that. I think this is our last question. Hey man, uh, yeah, thanks again for the talk. That was really good. Um, I really empathize with all the challenges you guys have faced at different uh, parts of your stack. I am curious where you think, like in your view for the internet, at what layer uh, does it make sense to have anti-phishing, anti-spam efforts? If not at the portal layer, if not at the application layer, where makes sense? Yeah, so I think anti-phishing and anti-spam uh, probably happen well, maybe in the same layer, which which I would say is is the user the user level. Um, you don't want, for example, your hard drive to be opinionated about what what websites you're loading. And I th I think it's the same thing. You don't want your ISP to be opinionated about what what websites you're loading. I think instead, uh, at least in my head, kind of the utopian ideal is that a user would subscribe to services that basically filter on their behalf. Um, and, and with things like banking, and, and I just don't think that you should access your bank through a web page. Um, the way identity works on the internet is just like fundamentally broken and fundamentally vulnerable to phishing. If you have like a single sign-on, right? Like, like you already logged into your iPhone, why can't that also simultaneously log you into your bank? And it, it, if you connect those things more deeply, which again, I think to do safely, you need to do that in a decentralized way. But if, if you can connect those things more deeply, you completely annihilate phishing as a class of attack because it, a user never goes and puts credentials into their bank account. It just it's part of logging into your iPhone. Gets also gets you into your bank, and and you can't get into your bank without it. So, um, at least at the phishing level, I think there's there's like a more fundamental identity oriented way to solve the issue. With spam, I think you just have to uh, subscribe to like uh, curation lists, um, and I think I think spams. It's a fun issue because uh, you know abuse and rights aside, it's just a UX problem. Like no, nobody wants to deal with spam, and if, if you're fully decentralized, you will have spam everywhere. Um, and so you you know you have to come up with with methods methods of preventing spam from reaching the uh, the user's eyeballs just so they have a good experience. Um, but yeah, I, I think these are open questions. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, it was great to be here.